we could argue for hours on the value of what is cruel and humane, but to take 12 hours to kill an animal cannot be considered humane. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bears. Before we get started this week, I want to put out a general advisory. In this episode, we will be speaking in a matter-of-fact tone about the cruelty of snare traps and the poison strychnine. You will hear details about how these devices work and the devastation they cause in plain language, and that may be upsetting to some listeners. Dr. Gilbert Pru has seen a lot in his years as a field biologist, and he's had enough. Dr. Pru runs Alpha Wildlife Research and Management Limited, where he conducts in-field research, writes and edits studies, consults with landowners, businesses, and governments, and publishes papers on a variety of wildlife-related issues. Dr. Pru has often delved into science-based ethical topics, too, and that's the basis of his latest publication. There is a clear body of evidence that killing neck snares and strychnine poison are inhumane, some of it developed by Dr. Pru himself. Yet trappers and governments continue to endorse both methods of killing for thousands of animals every year. Dr. Pru's new book, Intolerable Cruelty, The Truth Behind Killing Neck Snares and Strychnine, is an accumulation of hard evidence, experience, and a clear case to end the use of these inhumane tools. Dr. Pru joined Defender Radio to discuss killing neck snares and strychnine in detail, as well as alternatives to lethal control and why governments, wildlife managers, and trappers continue to use methods that can scientifically and ethically be defined as cruel. Before we start talking about the book, we're going to have a mixed audience listening to this one, I know. We get, uh, um, okay. there are various, you know, government people that will listen to the show. Uh, I know some trappers and hunters listen to the show out of interest. And I oh, want to preface, yeah, I want to preface all of this Um by noting that you are not opposed to trapping, you are not opposed to hunting. Um, no. So this is not a political thing. This is not a an emotional thing, uh, which... Uh, not at all. No. Yeah. And there's a time to have those conversations, but that's not the conversation we're going to have today. And on that note, uh, what led... I mean, you've, you've put together this book, Intolerable Cruelty. What was yes. the sort of the impetus for you to decide to put together a, a full book on the subject of killing neck snares and uh, strychnine. Okay, well, the uh, the the uh, the subjects have come out of frustration as a scientist because uh, in both cases I was pretty much the only scientist that really worked in detail on the study of snares and uh, strychnine in Canada. And uh, uh, in the case of the snares, in the in 1990s, we told everybody that killing neck snares doesn't work. And one of the reasons is that, uh, the and we can come back on that, the physiology and the uh, structure of uh, foxes, coyotes, and wolves doesn't lead to a quick uh, death. And uh, we have shown that uh, those snares were unreliable and also unselective. And that's, uh, that's almost uh, 30 years ago. And uh, since then, the uh, trappers uh, said, oh, our technology has changed and so on. And it's not true. It's the same technology as 40 years ago, same wires, same locks and so on. And uh, when I went and uh, I, I work on wildlife and uh, I come across several trap lines in Western Canada, and I find dead animals in the fields and or I find the snares. And this time I put cameras and I was able to once again prove that I was right, that snares do not work well. So uh, I'm tired of people who claim that uh, snares kill rapidly. I'm tired of trappers who claim that uh, they love nature and they would not use snares if it was not humane. And I'm tired of uh, wildlife biologists who know that snares are not humane but do nothing about it and they should just quit their job and go in another field altogether. With strychnine, it was the same situation. In the 1990s, we started to analyze 
the impact of uh, strychnine on the control of pocket gophers and Richardson's ground squirrels in Canada. In Western Canada, those two fossorial rodents cause a lot of damage in uh, agricultural fields with, that net, with their network of, uh, of uh, tunnels and also their feeding habits. And uh, while these animals in the wild are controlled by long-tailed weasels, badgers, and uh, other uh, coyotes and foxes, uh, when you do monocultures of alfalfa, uh, these animals do very well, and actually uh, there's no more balance, plus the fact that farmers kill a lot of those predators to start with. So we analyze, uh, we assess the impact of strychnine on, these, on both species, and we found almost 30 years ago again that uh, these poisons were not doing a good job and farmers who were investing their money in that were actually throwing their money outside the, the, their window, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in spite of that, the government uh, continuously uh, re, uh, re, uh, registered that uh, those poisons, and now we're at a point where we're losing our weasels. Our the the badger, the American badger in the prairies, is now a species of special concern. Uh, we're killing everything but the pocket gophers and the ground squirrels. Uh, and you know these are uh, species where you need to kill at least seventy percent of a population if you want to make a dent in the population in an agricultural field. Those poisons don't come close to that. And again, we have farmers that putting pressure on the federal government to keep the poisons, which they spread in, uh, often in an irresponsible way and cause damage to wildlife communities. And the federal government this year was ready to ban that poison, and uh, the uh, beef organizations from Saskatchewan and, and Alberta requested that the poison be kept, and now we know that the decision will take another 450 days before uh, they make a final decision on the ban of strychnine. And in the meantime, uh, more animals will suffer a long death and will be misused. And in Alberta, they also have a special permit to use strychnine to kill wolf, coyotes, and bears. So it's, it's just uh, crazy what's going on with the use of killing snares and strychnine right now. Uh, there is... Uh, just with this, the, the snare, there is about, uh, on average, 70,000 wolves, coyotes, and foxes that are killed every year and suffer long deaths. Uh, with the use of strychnine, you can add uh, several other thousands to the uh, the total amount. So it's uh, it's just a uh, it's just uh, irresponsible. And as a, as a wildlife professional, it's time for me to, to tell people, listen, we have facts on the subject, we have scientific research, and now start to make arguments with the government, strappers, and other organizations, and present the facts. And since people are not scientists, a lot of them, but they are con concerned about the treatment of wildlife, we are providing the information that they now can use. And it's clear, it's black on white, and uh, they just have to present it to government. And now they have a tool to argue, ar argue their point of view, not on emotions, just on the scientific facts that a fox, a coyote, or a wolf may take 12 hours uh, more than, uh, than uh, three minutes to, to lose consciousness. That's awful, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we... We, we do hear about um, is those who support the use of snares or strict nine will say, well, you're just making an emotional argument. And, <laughs> right. I, and, and to be fair, sometimes we as advocates do that. We say, uh, you know, I'm not OK with this because it's upsetting to me or because I find it unethical. Um, yeah. But there is clear science on a lot of these subjects uh, from yeah. and we're we're going to focus on snares and strychnine, but I can pull in. We talk about coexistence techniques. There's this growing body of evidence that shows it's more effective yeah. than calling ants. We talk about um, you know even just uh, geospatial distribution of, of wildlife and various factors uh, as the environment changes. Like we're we're learning more, but we're not doing different. And I think that's almost no, sort of I, across I, I, the board. 
That's a good point, and uh, I, I do raise that point. Uh, one of the chapters in the book uh, is uh, what can you do, you know? And uh, we're not saying don't use Fig9 and snares just because we don't like the devices. It's because there are alternatives that actually are proper, are ethical, and do as good a job, if not better, and would be cheaper for the farmers or the, the trapper or the uh, wildlife agency. So it's just a question of being responsible and know the tools of the trade. We, you know, like the the, the snares became very popular. For example, uh, the snares very, became very popular after Second World War. They're cheap. They are easy to use. Uh, any fool can put a wire in the bush, you know. And mm-hmm. in many cases, we catch all type of things. Well, the the point is, trapping should be a profession. Uh, or an activity, at least, uh, where uh, people are selective in their activities and they dispatch the animal as fast as possible. For whatever reason, you remove the animal. Maybe an animal is uh, uh, carries a disease, you want to capture it, or maybe that uh, you're a trapper, you want the fur. We're not even discussing the uh, ethics behind those activities. That's another subject, as you said. If you're doing a good job, though, if you want to do a good job, uh, don't use snares or straight nine. You're you're making a mess, and it's time that we stop that nonsense. And I want to talk about jellyhead because this is something that, again, has been talked about. I know you've done the research. I know a few other people have done research on this. Uh, this is something that happens, and it can happen yes. quickly, or it can take, as you said, several hours. Could you describe, um, and we'll we'll maybe stick to being more academic in this conversation because it can be rather grotesque, but more or less what the physiological reaction is that we call jelly head? Okay. Just to to back up a second, trappers uh, and their supporters claim that an animal captured by the neck in the snare will die fast because the snare either stops the uh, breeding or it stops the blood circulation through the arteries and the venous system, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, our studies have shown that actually uh, none of this happens. Uh, particularly with dogs, there is a collateral uh, uh, circulation of the blood. And when the arteries, the, the major arteries and veins are, uh, are um, impacted, the uh, subsystem, the sub venous system and uh, artery system takes over and still maintains the circulation with the brain. But there's still a compression caused by the snare. And with that compression, you create a situation where water accumulates in the vessels, in, in the muscles. It's uh, called edema. Okay. So if you were to, uh, to, uh, put uh, a belt on your legs and uh, do a lot of activity, your legs will get bigger, okay? And we see that in people who don't do activity on the plane and they have to use compression uh, socks in order to force the blood to move around, you know? So when this happens, the muscles grow like a sponge and a coyote or a wolf captured in a snare, depending on his fixed physical characteristics can develop what we call the jelly head situation in a few hours or uh, over a longer time period. So the head uh, grows in size uh, because the water is accumulating in the muscles and it grows so big that sometimes it even shuts down the eyes of the animal. And uh, then in the, in the winter, when a lot of this trapping co- uh, happens, uh, this water freezes. And you end up with an animal with frozen limbs or frozen uh, uh, parts of his neck. Uh, Because I say limbs because sometimes they get their leg captured in the snare as well. And in the morning, when the sun comes out, it thaws. Now, I don't know if you ever uh, froze a finger, but a a one painful part is when it uh, thaws. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not while it's frozen, it's when it thaws. Well, now you have the old front part of the body, uh, of the head, that does that. Uh, The animal can hardly see, feel the the freezing, the thawing. It's uh, uncomfortable, it's painful. It's uh, and it of course it it, it leads to labor uh, breeding, but the animal still breeds. So uh, uh, it can take hours uh, to kill an animal like that, you know. And uh, in my book, um, 
one of the things that kind of incite me to really put out that book on snares is because uh, I was working on trap lines, uh, not on trap lines, in the bush. I was uh, following a fisher and uh, working on, on the distribution, and uh, I came across a series of uh, killing neck snares that were set for apparently wolves. So I decided to put cameras, uh, camouflage them, and see what happens on those uh, snares, with those snares. And I came back, and of course the trapper had not checked his traps. Uh, in Alberta, you don't have a minimum time period to visit your your uh, your snares. So a guy can wait two weeks if he wants to go visit it. And uh, I had uh, in uh, that series of snares that that particular trapper had set, I had a coyote and also I had a wolf. So I picked up my cameras, my, my chips and everything, came back home, and I studied the, uh, the cards. And uh, we saw what happens to those animals. And it confirmed what we had found during our research. And uh, one coyote had developed within 12 hours or uh, started to develop a jelly head. You know, his head was at least one third bigger than it should have been, you know. So this is a situation with Gilead. It's a poor circulation caused by by that, that snare that comes around the neck. One of the other problems, of course, is selectivity. And this is an issue for snares. It's an issue for strychnine and arguably for many other types of lethal control when someone's not present. Uh, how, why, let me rephrase that. Why is selectivity a larger issue with snares? And is there a way to use something like strychnine and guarantee um, that selectivity is not an issue, that you're only going to impact one species? Mm -hmm. No, uh, with those two devices, those two methods, it's absolutely impossible to eliminate non-target species. Uh, in the case of the snares, trappers will put one, two, or sometimes ten snares around a bait. Uh, so they do um, a ten square meter area or more, you know, and they put several snares. And the animals are uh, the snares are often on animal trails. So you can add uh, wires that will displace the the snare. If, for example, the moose walk with his head down, he will hit it with his nose and the snare will fall off, but he may get caught by the leg then. Um, uh, small animals or non-target animals, like you put a trap for a wolf, you will catch also a wolverine. You will catch uh, a small deer and so on. You cannot not stop uh, the capture of non-target species. And interestingly, in Alberta, where the snare wolves to protect caribou, allegedly protect caribou because the wolf is not the major issue mm -hmm. here, uh, they cut caribou and kill them. Yes. So they, 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 they kill the species that they are trying to, to, to save, you know. Uh, so with snares, no matter what you do, you will always capture uh, non-target species. And here in Alberta, for example, uh, we lose about 11% of our cougar populations to wool, uh, uh, snares set for wolves. We lose golden eagles, we lose wolverine, we lose grizzly bears, which are also threatened species. So it, it just, uh, it just impoverish a wildlife community. When you catch a fisher, uh, in one of those snare fisher can have uh, in the mountains a home range that goes from 20, 40 to 100 square kilometer. You remove the fisher, well, you need a fisher from far away to come in and replace him. So you, it doesn't take long that people will use snares uh, and straight nine. Uh, they remove all the wildlife of an area at the expense of trappers, hunters, or animal uh, observers, you know. It's the same with strict nine. Uh, with strict nine, there is two situations. They use strict nine to, as I said before, to control rodents in the field. Well, the, the laws of application for strict nine is that you must put the bait in the burrow system of the animal. Well, in the case of the ground squirrel, where the most, uh, for which uh, strict nine is mostly used, uh, ground squirrels, uh, at least 50% of uh, the population will clean its borrow system and throw outside the borrow system on surface. They will throw the, the oats that are laced with strict nine. 
Well, all the birds, the mice that come by will feed on them, and then they are being eaten by scavenger or predators like coyotes and uh, and, and uh, foxes. And these animals in return will die. I had a case where uh, I found a harrier, uh, a, a bird of prey. I, uh, he was dead in the field. I opened it up and I found a mouse. I opened the mouse. There were two kernels of strychnine in, uh, in his body. So it doesn't take long, doesn't take much to kill some of those animals. Uh, the other problem is we have Alberta government who uses strychnine to kill wolves. Um, they say, and that's almost a joke, that they use uh, small balls of meat, they put strychnine in it, and they borrow it, uh, they, they place it under the snow, uh, a few feet under the snow. And then, they had, it's amazing, they say only the dog types, you know, the canids can find those meatballs. Mm -hmm. But when you go in the field and you find ravens, marten, fisher dead on surface, well, that shows that those balls come on surface for the ravens to use them. And, you know, a marten, a fisher, can smell a bait a mile away, you know. And when they travel on snow, and they can pick up the bait as much as any dog type uh, animal yeah. so anybody that has a nose and is a carnivore probably can pick up those baits and die so it's and, and you know strict nine uh strict nine that will kill a coyote will kill a, a martin of course you know and depending if their their stomach is full depending how much the bait they eat and so on they may die right away. They may take two hours. Some may take 24 hours. It's awful. I've seen animals dying of strict nine. You see that they have a pain in their belly, the, the kind of uh, uh, cramp, you know, the, the, their, their upper body makes a ball, you know. And the, uh, in the case of ground squirrel, you hear them uh, even cry, you know. And some can travel quite a bit of a distance. I've seen squirrel crossing a full field of alfalfa, and you die at the end of the field. Well, with larger animals, they will go maybe a mile, two miles away. The government will never find them. And these animals are eaten by other animals. So no surprise in the spring, we find dead bears as well, even though the base are supposed to be for foxes and wolves only. So, you know, it's, it's not selective. It's amazing that in these days and age, we still use techniques such as this. You know, we're so much more evolved than that. You know, I have I, I have an odd question, and I don't know if there's any validity behind this. I'm just leading with curiosity here. You talked about setting up trail cams and camouflaging them so you could see how the animals responded when caught in snares. How many trappers do you think have done that? Because as you mentioned, and this is something I've wondered about. They'll go out and set their, we'll say, snares, uh, as you said, and come back in 10 days or two weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I've seen the same thing, you know, with beaver uh, conibear sets and various other traps that are killing traps. And they come back and say, oh, well, look, he's dead. How many of them <laughs> yeah. are aware of what happened in that from the moment they set the trap through to finding a carcass? Because I wonder, like, is, is that part of the disconnect? Well, you know, you want to believe what you want to believe, you know. Yeah. There is some trappers that when they pick up the animal in the snare, they see blood everywhere or they see how the animal, uh, uh, how the snare embedded itself in the muscles and things of the sort. They will make the connection and say, whoa, that was not humane. A lot of those trappers will not even use snares again, mm -hmm. okay. So... The, the trapper community has these bad people and these good ones, but they have also their big mouth that either make money with snares by selling the snares or by selling the animals that they capture in those snares. And these people come up with, uh, there, there was a, a movie uh, called uh, uh, Unnatural Enemies, The War on Wolves, and there is a trapper in this who is uh, actually a, a member of the Alberta Trapper Association, and he says, well, Wolves die in seconds in the snare. Uh, and then when you see him checking his snares in the movie, you see him going really careful and approaching the, the trap site. 
Well, if Danny Moe buys and says, you don't have to be careful. You go, yeah. you remove the body, you know? No, he knows that there might be a wolf there that is in a bad mood, you know? So th- these people, they know, but they are playing the game of the trapper who knows better, the guy who knows better, the bush, or the, the guy who loves so much animals, he will do, use nothing to hurt them. So there is a lot of blinds or around the head of those trappers. And, you know, I, I, I spend most of my life in the bush, and uh, they cannot argue that snares are humane. And interestingly, years ago, <laughs> I sent an email to a, trapper, uh, a trapper's uh, representatives here in Alberta, and I said, listen, let's settle the case here. I will go on your trap line. I won't touch nothing. I will do nothing to impact on you. I will put my traps, uh, my, my cameras, and we will monitor your snares. Nobody wanted to allow me, yeah. you know. And they would come with all type of reason. Oh, the trap could impact on the capture, you know. The, no, this is, I think that most trappers, a lot of trappers know, but they don't want to admit. And also, Thing that a lot of trappers have never seen an animal die in their snares. They come up, the, the animal is laying down by the anchor of the snare, and if it snowed, you won't see the blood or you won't see the damages that the animal did to the vegetation. And he may conclude, wow, that animal is exactly where I put my snares, no breakage, nothing. He died fast. Uh, that's false assumption. You know, like, when I did my research on killing snares, I will set uh, hours watching uh, the animals approaching and getting captured in those snares, and I've seen what happens. And we had worked with power snares. These are snares that are even more powerful than the most of the manual snares that trapper use because there is a spring that apply pressure on the animal's neck. Um, and we concluded it's impossible to kill these animals with those things, but we have seen it with our own eyes. With Strig 9, we knew better than any farmer on this because we, before using Strig 9, we captured all the animals, we marked them out, so we had thousands of ground squirrels, all with a tag in their ears, mm-hmm. and we released them. Then we put Strig 9 uh, baits, you know, and then after that, after 10 days, we go back and recapture the population. In more cases, than, uh, in most of the cases, strict nine will not kill 30% of the population. Unless there is no more vegetation, you know, during a very bad drought year, then uh, ground squirrels will eat anything, including your shoes, you know. But uh, if there is green vegetation, they won't touch strict nine. But they will kill, these poisons will kill mice, birds, and we have, we have found them in the field. And we publish on that. We, we know it does not work. We know it kills everything sometimes, but the species you want to control. So that, um, that uh, simple mind approach, you know, to use strict nine to control these animals is amazing. Uh, the, it's all based on assumptions. It, it, people don't read, obviously, you know. So we need people to, to get these facts and face their governments at different level, municipal, provincial, and federal, and say, these are the facts that has been studied here. You can refer to those, and we need to stop that nonsense. The last really difficult question I want to ask you is regarding the concept of humane. Uh, so in your title, the title of the book is Intolerable Cruelty again. Uh, and yes. cruelty and humane are arguably subjective terms. So That's this funny. is something that we come up against a lot. Uh, we'll hear trappers say, oh, well, it's a humane trap. And my response <laughs> tends to be, well, it's a it's a humane trap according to a trade agreement. Um, right. And like that, that's how all of that came to be. So uh, how do we, I, I, this is something that I hear about from everyone involved, from people who work for the SPCA to researchers like yourself, to advocates like me, to trappers, to hunters, everything. How do we have a conversation about this when one of the most commonly used phrases doesn't have a clear definition? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, humaneness, uh, cruelty, um, not enough animals or too many animals, these are values. These are values that we push upon ourselves. 
uh, same as uh, rights. Now, I always said animals have no rights. And humans, though, have a responsibility to behave properly towards animals, okay? According to standards that we, are, we, are, we, we push upon ourselves. And our standards from a regulation point of view in Canada requires that animals lose consciousness within three to five minutes, depending on the species that is uh, being captured. In the uh, case of hunting, we know that if you go shoot a moose with a 22 rifle, chances are that that animal will not die as fast as if you use a 30 odd six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's to to do the proper job at the right place. We went through that with slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. There was a time with slaughterhouses where there was no um, reference, no standard. And some animals were suffering a long time. Since then, we came with para paralyzing guns. We uh, There was an, uh, a technique to bleed the animals fast and so on. And I know it sounds gruesome to say, but there is a technique to kill faster in the case of these animals. And it has been uh, embedded in our society as that's the way to do things. We're not in the days anymore of the uh, uh, Homo erectus or those type of uh, previous uh, early humans where um, uh, it's a question of life or death and you catch whatever you can and you eat. Now we're in a society that has come a long way and killing animals uh, may be part of an activity, an industry or a sport, but it still has to be done properly. Now, the one thing that trappers will often use is have you seen a deer get killed by either coyotes or wolf? Well, the animal doesn't die right away, and the, the, you have to yeah, you have to wait that the animal uh, eventually uh, bleeds to death or die uh, mm -hmm. through uh, uh, lack of uh, of oxygen, you know, and so on. So they compare themselves to wolves and coyotes. Well, I'll tell you something: there is not one wolf or coyote that takes twelve hours to kill a deer, you know. It, they will do it. It might be five, ten minutes, but it's not going to be 12 hours. And that's the problem with snares and strict line. You, you're, you're talking hours in many cases. Uh, and the wolves and the coyotes, they don't kill accidentally uh, something they don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. They kill what they want. So um, it, the notion of humaneness and cruelty is relative. But if you compare with anything that happens in nature, our actions are not acceptable. And comes a moment, you have to use the word for what they are. Like right now, the government, instead of saying, we will kill wolves, they will say, we call, C-U-L-L, -L, we call wolves. It's like, uh, uh, you know, like a, the army comes with a lot of words to replace the word but body bags and things like that. So you can come with all those names, but at the end of the day, if an animal is there behind uh, a, a tree and has been uh, cutting himself, bleeding, and is still conscious after 12 hours, there's not a whole lot of other words than cruelty that applies to that, you know? So, you know, we have standards. Uh, Canada has established standards. They are not representative of state-of-the-art research, but they are a major improvement over what we used to have. Uh, for example, look at the Lego trap. We used to have still Lego trap that will skin the leg of an animal and then the trapper will come and the animal will be suffering. Now we have improved on the trap so that the animal doesn't skin himself while it's being captured. And that's irrelevant if you like or not to capture the animal. It's just a question of not causing physical damage to the animal. And that applies to anything. We, as researchers, we develop a standard that is even more stringent. And an animal must lose consciousness within three minutes. Well, this will never happen with snares. It will never happen within five minutes, which is used in the agreement with Canada on humane traps. It will never happen in a couple hours. Most, most animals will require four to 10 to 12 hours before to die. So all being relative, it is unacceptable when it comes to terms of cruelty. Well, we're at that stage right now. We're at the stage of saying, calling things for what they are. Yesterday or two days ago, the, there is uh, two young men 
two, uh, two, two teenagers in Alberta who beat uh, Kayo to death for two hours, hitting him on the head. Mm-hmm. And people were were saying, this is disgusting. And it is disgusting. There's something wrong with those people, you know. And uh, the government may consider doing charges, whatever. We don't know yet what will happen. And people saw that and they said, wow, this is amazing. This is cruel. This is improper. Well, we have snares there that takes 10 hours and they do the same things, but the people don't see them. But we, in the book, we put the pictures. We put the sequence of all those pictures that, co- that happened to those animals. Catch, and now they can see it. So if it's improper to beat an animal to death for two hours, it's improper to take 12 hours to beat another one, you know. It's all relative. But wildlife management is also a, a, a value. It's not something that is uh, um, inscribed in nature, you know. Mm-hmm. Like when, when wildlife biologists or trappers or hunters say there is too many wolves for it, uh, and not enough deer. Well, that's their judgments because they want to shoot the deer instead of having the wolves killing the deer. It's all relative, you know. But comes a moment you have to say, well, you need a minimum animals to control the disease in the in the field, and you need minimum animals to please different activities, including those of humans. When it comes to cruelty, there is a standard, a minimum respect we must have for nature, a minimum respect for our activity that needs to be done. If you cannot do it right, don't do it at all. So we could argue for hours on the value of what is cruel and humane, but to take 12 hours to kill an animal cannot be considered humane. To order a copy of Intolerable Cruelty, click the links in this week's show notes or on the Defender Radio blog at thefurbears.com. It's worth a read and a powerful tool for advocates everywhere. Dr. Prue's other research can be found at alphawildlife.ca. I want to thank Dr. Prue for his time and all of you for listening. This is a difficult subject, but discussing it and talking out the issues is an important step to finding solutions to end inhumane treatment of wildlife. Thank you. Please remember to follow me on social media at Defender Radio on Facebook and Twitter and at Howie Michael on Instagram. I'll be posting some exciting updates soon and also reviving content and giveaways for the Defender Radio Patreon. So follow along and stay up to date. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. Stay strong.